welcome to worship, you well-rested people. Extra hour of sleep, it is wonderful. My only complaint about ch clock changes is they don't tell babies and they don't tell dogs. So I was still up early this morning, and unfortunately. Today, as you probably realize, is All Saints Day. We will be remembering all of you saints in the pews and the ones who have joined the church triumphant. And so it is always a special day, and especially when we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. I want to welcome any members and visitors that are here. Well, I know my members are here. My visitors that are here, and we ask members and visitors to sign the little friendship registers and then pass them along so you know with whom you are worshiping this morning. Uh, the deacon offering for the month of November is going directly to two churches um, in North Carolina. One is Church of the Sky. It's a United Church of Christ church. And it is, they were hit hard by Hurricane Helene, as you know. And the other church that we're in touch with is Black Mountain Presbyterian Church uh, in Black Mountain, North Carolina. So they are serving the community of Black Mountain and a community called Swananoa, who are really hit hard. And last Sunday, according to their website, they served 800 meals, and people are being housed in their sanctuary. And so we really want to help them out as best we can, so please be generous with our deacon offering. This week on Monday at 5 o'clock, there is a panel discussion at Stockton University at the main campus uh, to foster unity and understanding among people of other faiths, of all faiths. Uh, as you know, I'm part of Bridge of Faith here on the island, and we are with Jews and Muslims and Christians, and we get together and we discuss, and it is very enlightening, and it's also a wonderful healing kind of uh, um, uh, activity, and so this panel discussion is going to be open to the public and for the students, of course. On Wednesday at 6 o'clock, Excuse me. At 6 o'clock, the bell choir is going to rehearse, and at 7 o'clock, the chancel choir rehearses. On Thursday at 8 a.m., we have the men's breakfast, so please come. We have some food, and we have some great discussion. And at noon, the Charity League is packing their cookie boxes. And Carmela and I are especially happy because we get the broken cookies, and everybody knows there are no calories in broken cookies. That's what we tell ourselves, anyway. Uh, next Sunday, the Advisory Council meets after church, and also it's peanut butter and jelly Sunday. So if you have time next week to spend with us making our 300 sandwiches, that would be a real blessing. Now, most of you, I am sure, received a letter from me, from the church, um, with an estimate card in it for giving for the next year. As you probably know, in November, we look at budgets for the next year, and we want to be good stewards of what we will receive or expect to receive, and so that we can plan for our programs and for all the things that make up a church family. So prayerfully and carefully consider what you might be able to give for next year. You realize, of course, this is not an IOU. This is just an estimate so that we can have an idea of what we may plan. And now let us begin our worship by listening to the intro. <laughs> Good morning. Please join in the call to worship found on your bulletin. 
Leaders have gone before us and saints are with us now. Everyday people with generous hands and listening ears. Holy ones who radiate love and embody compassion. Saints before us and saints around us. There is no higher call and no greater joy than making a difference in the kingdom of God. Let us worship God together. Please join us in the opening hymn of page 555, Forward Through the Ages. Sing all, ver all three verses. Please join me in the prayer. Merciful God, you call us to your table of grace to enjoy your presence, to experience your healing, to be made one with your people of every time and place. We confess we have edged you to the fringes of our lives 
as we have become occupied with countless so-called urgent matters. We confess we have fooled ourselves into believing we are too busy to pray and too exhausted to serve. In humility and faith, we turn to you again. Help us to be better disciples, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Then we will be free to celebrate your feast of love with the saints of this and every time and place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please also join me in the affirmation of faith. We believe in God, creator of beauty, source of every breath, foundation of every movement. God leads us beside still waters to make us lie down in green splendor and lets nature heal and restore us. We believe in Jesus, the risen Christ, who loved the least, the last, and the lost. Christ loves us, calls us by name, and cleanses us from our sins. We believe in the Spirit, who gathers us into a community, gives us a song to sing, and prepares a feast for us all. We live as God's people, filled with everlasting hope, and showered with blessing. Let us continue our worship by presenting our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings.
Let us pray. Bless us, O God, with the spirit of your love, so that these gifts and our actions might reflect the call of Jesus to serve all those in need. Use these gifts and use us. Multiply our efforts through the ministries of this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Before I read the scripture passage, um, as you all know, this is All Saints Day, and as I was preparing for this week, I couldn't help but think back on some of the people that we have known over the years, one of which passed away just recently, Mary Lou Adams Crimbring. And of course, I think you've seen the uh, sermon title, Will You Be Remembered as One Who Knew the Power of Words? And I was thinking of Mary Lou in particular when I was writing the sermon. She had wonderful words of wisdom for so many of us. Carmela comes to tears when she thinks about Mary Lou because Mary Lou helped her so much when she first started here at the church. And I know our nursery school director, Cindy, called Mary Lou many times for some words of wisdom about children and about parents. I think mostly parents. <laughs> and then as I thought back some more, I thought about Mary Lou's husband, Bill. When I first came here, Bill would come to church every Monday morning and keep record of all the donations that all of you so graciously make to the church. And before he left, it would be around 1130, he would stop in my office and we would just talk. He had words about people in the church. He told me about things that had happened and the people that were here and I ran ideas past him. And so those words of both of those people were so powerful in our lives. And so I, I have the scripture passage today. It's actually not Acts 3. It's the correct passage written here, but it's from Luke 7, verses 1 through 10. So listen for God's word to you this morning. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At that time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them, but just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I am not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are, and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say go, and they go, or come, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to his house, they found the slave completely healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The little story that I'm going to start with in my sermon really touched me because I spent 18 years teaching music in schools. Um, I taught in both public school and parochial school. 
And so the story I have is about a nun who was teaching in a Catholic school in Minnesota. Her name was Sister Mary Marosha. And she told us a really touching story about experience she had with some of her students many years ago now. Sister Helen was teaching third grade and she loved all of the kids. I could identify with that because I usually taught K to eight, and my favorite grades were two, three, and four. They were decent, nice children. After that, couldn't, couldn't say. But there was one third grader in her class named Mark Eklund, who was one in a million. He was always very neat in his appearance, he, but he had this carefree attitude and, and that even made his mischievous side very nice. Mark talked incessantly. We've all known kids that will not be quiet in a class. And Sister Helen had to keep reminding him that talking when he wasn't supposed to was absolutely unacceptable. But what impressed Sister Helen so much was Mark's sincere response. Every time he was corrected for misbehaving, he'd say, Thank you for correcting me, sister. And at first, Helen wasn't sure if he was just being a phony, but then it dawned on her that no, he was actually serious every time he said it. And boy, did she say it many times every single day. One morning, Sister Helen's patience grew very thin, and Mark talked way too often. She looked at Mark and said, if you say one more word, I am going to put tape over your mouth. Well, in about five minutes or less, a classmate blurted out, he's talking again, sister. <laughs> well, Helen hadn't asked the, the kids to watch Mark, but she thought she had to carry through with this punishment because you don't want to make idle threats. Now, you can tell this is a parochial school. You can't get away with this in public school. So she walked over to the drawer at her desk and pulled off two pieces of masking tape and went over to Mark and made an X across his mouth. When she walked to the front of the class, she glanced at him and he winked at her. And then she started to laugh. And she went back over and took the tape off to the cheers of the other kids in the classroom. And Mark's first words were, thank you for correcting me, sister. At the end of that year, at the end of the third grade year, she was asked to no longer teach third graders and move up to junior high math. Well, the years flew by and wouldn't you know, Mark was back in her math class again in eighth grade. But he was more handsome than ever and more mischievous than ever, and he definitely did not quite talk as much in eighth grade as he had in third grade because he was really concentrating on learning the math. Well, one Friday during the day, it just didn't feel right in the classroom. The class had been working on a math concept all week, and the students were frustrated to the point that they were edgy with each other and with themselves. And Sister Helen felt that she had to stop the crankiness right then and there. So she asked the kids to just stop what they were doing and take out two clean pieces of notebook paper. And she wanted the kids to list every child in the class and leave a space under each name. And then she told them to write down the nicest thing they could think of for each student. And the activity, of course, took the remainder of the class. That was a Friday. The next day, Sister Helen sat down with all those lists and made a piece of paper for each individual child and wrote down all the nice things that everyone had said about each one. On Monday, she gave those papers back to the kids. Nothing more was said about it. Well, no one ever mentioned those papers again but it didn't matter to Sister Helen because the exercise had served its purpose. The kids were smiling again 
and not cross with one another. Some years later, Sister Helen was returning home from a vacation and members of her family, her own family of origin, picked her up from the airport. And riding home in the car, she sensed that something was wrong. Dad, she said, is there anything wrong? It seems so quiet in the car. And he said, the Ecklands called last night. And Sister Helen said, really? I haven't heard from them for years. I wonder how Mark is. Her father responded quietly, Mark was killed in Vietnam last week. The funeral is tomorrow, and her parents asked if you would be there. Well, Sister Helen, of course, went to the funeral the next day, and it seemed unreal to her that Mark, who had been so young and so handsome and so full of life, could be gone. As she looked at Mark in the casket, Sister Helen thought, I would give all the masking tape in the world if I could hear his voice one more time. After the funeral, most of Mark's former classmates all got together at one of the boys' houses. Mark's mother and father actually were there too. And they said to Sister Helen, we want to show you something, sister. And he pulled out a wallet. He said this was Mark's wallet. They found it on him when he was killed in Vietnam. And there's something in here, sister, that I think you would recognize. And opening the billfold, he carefully picked up a piece of paper, of notebook paper, that had been taped and folded and refolded many times. Sister Helen knew immediately what it was. It was the list of all the good things that the classmates had written about Mark all those years before. Thank you for doing that, Mark's mother said. As you can see, Mark treasured it. And then an amazing thing happened. Mark's former classmates were watching, and suddenly they all started talking at once. Charlie blurted out, I still have my list. It's in the top drawer of my desk at home. A girl named Marilyn said, I have mine too. I keep it in my diary. Chuck's wife said, Chuck still has his list. In fact, he made me put it in our wedding album. And then Susan, another classmate, reached into her purse pulled out her wallet and showed the list that she had. She said, I carry my list with me at all times. I think we all saved our lists. Well, as you can imagine, Sister Helen sat down and cried. She cried for Mark. She cried for the people who would miss him. And she cried because she was so touched that all of these kids kept those lists. Later on, Sister Helen said that she learned a great lesson that day, a lesson about the power of words, a lesson about the power of empathy and love and encouragement that can so dramatically affect the life of another person. People are hungry for words that lift and heal. Now that's what this scripture passage actually is all about. A Roman soldier asked Jesus to help his servant. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. What a powerful verse that is. And let's just take a quick look at that story. As Jesus came back to the city of Capernaum, the soldier made an unusual request through Jewish friends. That almost sounds like it's almost impossible. But in this particular case, that centurion was close to some of the Jewish people. Lord, he said, my servant is gravely ill. I'm so worried about him. He's in terrible distress. He needs your help. And Jesus was touched by the extraordinary compassion of this soldier. Because at that time, most masters were not very nice to their slaves. They worked them as hard as they could and discarded them when they could no longer work. But this soldier was different. 
He loved his slave like a member of the family. He was deeply upset about the slave's illness and was determined to do everything he could to help him. Jesus was impressed by this soldier and said, I will come and heal him. But the soldier answered, Lord, I am not worthy to have you in my house, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus was so moved by his faith, he replied, go, let it be done for you according to your faith. And the servant was healed. End of story. And by the way, that same story is recorded again in Matthew's gospel, the eighth chapter. So at this point, we can go in several directions for the rest of the sermon. We could examine the great faith of this Roman soldier, a faith so strong that it impressed Jesus, or we could discuss the marvelous capacity of Jesus to bridge the gap between nations, between Jews and Romans, or we could look at the awesome power of Jesus to heal people even from a distance. But for now, let's just zero in on the healing power of words. Just say the words and healing will come. Of course, we all know that Jesus could speak words of healing for diseases, but on a lesser level, in a different dimension, and in a significant way, so can we. This is actually the calling of the church, to continue the preaching, teaching, caring, healing ministry of Jesus. And one way we can fulfill that calling is by speaking powerful words that can bring healing to hurting hearts and wholeness to grieving and hurting spirits. Let me show you what I mean. First of all, we can speak words of empathy. A few summers ago, while on vacation, a minister friend of mine said she went to worship at one of those contemporary churches. I don't need to explain that to you. She said the associate pastor preached a wonderful sermon. It was a nice service. And then something happened that the congregation was still talking about. You see, in that church, the organ music was actually done by a piano that was programmed to sound like an organ. And it was actually programmed so it would play certain songs without anybody being at the keyboard. So the organist, when they took the offering, pressed the button for the doxology. They sang the doxology when the offering was presented, just like we do. Only it wasn't the doxology. It played the wedding march. <laughs> so as the congregation broke into a hysterical laughter and the organist scrambled to push another button on that piano keyboard, one of the ushers said loudly, I do. <laughs> Just the right words for that moment. And you know, I admire people who can come up with the right thing to say at the right time. This is especially true with the word empathy. If sympathy is feeling sorry for someone, then empathy is feeling sorry with someone. It means to feel their hurt, to experience their pain, and walk in their shoes. Now, I think I've mentioned in some sermons over the last few years about my Aunt Ellen. My Aunt Ellen was a character. She was so dear to me, I can't begin to tell you. She, my earliest memories of her wearing spike heels, so you wonder where I get my you know, love of spike heels, but my earliest memories was getting her spike heels caught in the boardwalk. Remember when that happened? And when she was 85 years old, she joined an exercise class that played music along with the exercises, and she called to tell me that she felt like a chorus girl at 85. She and my mom were very close sisters, but completely opposite in personalities. My mother was much more serious. I've also mentioned in the past that during my childhood, my cousin and my aunt spent the summers with us in Ventnor. They lived in Philadelphia during the year, summered in Ventnor, and it was great for my cousin and I. And I have lots of memories about that. 
But there's one memory that I have of being about seven years old. My mom had just poured a glass of milk and handed it to me. Big mistake. Just as I got to the table, I guess the glass was wet, it slipped right out of my hand and the milk went all over the table. Well, my mom was very exasperated. She probably had tried hard to make a nice looking table and here it was all messed up. So she yelled at me. Well, I heard my aunt whisper something to her and you know, whispers, kids have big ears, they hear everything, right? My aunt said, oh, Victoria, it's only milk. And then she turned to me and said, oops, we had an accident here. You know, I just think you weren't supposed to drink that milk. There must have been something wrong with it, and that's why it fell. So she got a dishcloth and started cleaning it all up. Well, I have lots of wonderful memories of my mom and my aunt. My mom was wonderful, but my aunt just had that special way about her. She spoke sweet words of empathy that day. And I was upset. I didn't want to make my mom mad. And so she spoke the words that a seven-year-old needed to hear. Just say the words of empathy and healing will happen. And second, we can speak words of love. It's been documented time and time again that words of love are healing. That's exactly what the old Robin Williams movie Patch Adams was all about. When we see people hurting, we want to help them, to speak words of love and call them by name. When I was in seminary, as you might imagine, I was required to take a pastoral care class. And one day my professor gave a pop quiz. It wasn't that difficult, a quiz, until we got to the last question and it said, what is the first name of the woman who cleans this building? We all thought it might be a joke. And one of the students went to him and said, we all see her every day. Does this question, is this question gonna count for the quiz grade? And the professor said, it certainly is. You are training to be in pastoral care, to take care of people. And if you're gonna meet them, everybody is significant, all are important, all need your attention and care and kindness. And I'll never forget that lesson. I also learned that cleaning lady's name, Estella. Just say the words of empathy and love and healing will come. And third and lastly, we can speak words of encouragement. In a book called Mistreated, Ron Lee Davis tells about two altar boys. One was born in 1892 in Eastern Europe. The other was born in 1895 in a small town in Illinois. If you're from Atlantic City, it's Illinois, but that's beside the point. The boys lived different lives in different parts of the world, but had an almost identical experience. When they were young, they were both altar boys in a Catholic church. Ironically, each boy accidentally spilled some wine from the chalice while he was helping the priest. Each boy was embarrassed, ashamed, and afraid because of the mishap. But that's where the similarity ends. The priest in the Eastern European church slapped the altar boy across the face and said, get out of here and don't ever come back. He grew up to be an atheist and a communist his name was, um, I'm hoping I pronounced this right, Joseph Braz Tito, who became a ruthless dictator of Yugoslavia from 1943 to 1980. In the church in Illinois, the priest dropped down on one knee so that he was eye level with the little altar boy and said, it's all right, son, you'll do better next time. You'll be a fine priest for God someday the boy grew up to be the respected and beloved Bishop Fulton Sheen. Two similar experiences with graphically different endings, all because someone spoke the powerful words of encouragement 
and someone else did not. Just say the words. In the spirit of Christ, say the words of empathy, love, and encouragement, and healing will come. If you say the words, God will do the rest. God will bring the healing. So how are you doing with this? Do you speak words that build up or words that tear down? How will you be remembered? Will you re be remembered as someone who knew the power of words and used that power well? I hope so. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, you have given us so much power in the use of language. Help us always to use our words for being kind and good, to build up and heal. Help us to follow Jesus' example. Amen. And now please join me in singing our communion hymn. <laughs> Will you stand for the uh, prayer of confession? Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. My friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God, the meal that joins heaven and earth, joins us with those who have gone before us into the church triumphant and those who are with us in this place. The Bible tells us that they will come from north and south and east and west to join at the table in God's kingdom. Christ has prepared this feast with his own body and blood and invites all who love and trust him to come to the table. Let us pray. It is our greatest joy, O God, to give you thanks and praise. O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe, we praise you for saints and martyrs, for the faithful of every age, who have followed your son and witnessed to his resurrection. 
from every race and language, from every people and nation. You have gathered them into your kingdom. You have shown them the path of life and filled them with the joy of your presence. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He was sent to be our Savior. He took our flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. He went willingly to his death for us on the cross, and you raised him from the dead. To all who follow him, he gives abundant life. He is our risen Lord forever. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, the deacons will come forward and pass out the communion elements. For those of you who are visiting today, the communion element comes in one cup, it looks like. There are two tabs. The first one reveals a little wafer. The second, of course, is for the cup itself. Our Lord Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Our Lord Jesus said, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but he came into the world to save it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. The psalmist, of course, lived a life of faith. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. On the night that Jesus was arrested, he took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And if you will pull that first tab, let us eat together and be thankful. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us drink and be thankful. And the Apostle Paul reminds us that each time we eat this bread and drink this wine, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. 
These are God's gifts to us as God's beloved children. As we come to our prayer time after communion, I would like to read the list of prayer concerns of our congregation. We're praying for Dave McCann, Ken Heck, Neil Gamble, Lexi and her family, Tim, Dorothy, and Dawn, Carl, Lanny Walter, Bob Garbutt, Steve Jacoby, and who is going back to Maryland in two weeks, Steve, his grandson, Steve's grandson, Kevin, excuse me, Nancy Swartz's grandson, Dylan, Carl Ekstrom, Linda Donovan's mother, Gladys, and friends, Michelle and Don, Ginny Beck's friend, Kathy, and friend, Roy, Nancy Young's cousin, Marilyn, uh, Tom and Ann Klein's son, Ricky, who had surgery and is recovering and doing quite well. He is going to be starting chemo the week before Christmas. The Stubbs family, John Agner's friend, Ron, and Elaine McLathery's friends, Dina and Mary. And at this time, we read the list of those who have gone before us into the church triumphant. Lillian and Bobby Klingensmith, Maureen Boyce, Emily Money, Mary Lou Adams Crimbring. Are there any other joys or concerns to share? Then let us join our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for feeding us at your table of grace. May our lives be strengthened to show your love and grace and mercy in our daily lives. Eternal God, we know that neither death nor life can separate us from your love. Help us to serve you faithfully here on earth and in heaven someday to rejoice with all your saints. May we look forward to that glad day of reunion with our loved ones when we join our voices with theirs to proclaim your glory. This day, Lord, we ask again for your peace on this earth. Your word tells us that you make wars to cease unto the ends of the earth. So again, Lord, we plead for peace. Let the killing and hatred stop. Where there are bombs and violence, hatred, greed, disruption, hunger, and pain, may your touch renew those in need. And may we see new ways to ease the suffering when we can. We ask for your healing touch on those we know in our church family and friends. You have already heard our concerns. Hear now those that are known only to us and you in the silence of our hearts. Grant us your peace. Go with us, Lord, into this new week, renewed and restored from this time of worship together this morning. May we trust in your love and move forward in the lives you have given to us, knowing that we are always in your strong, capable hands. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us join together singing our last hymn, number 710, Faith of Our Fathers.
I hope you'll join us for coffee hour after church right down the hallway in Fellowship Hall. It's always good to catch up with those in our church family. And I hope that this week especially, you will think of saying uplifting things to the people around you so that you can build them up through words of love and encouragement. And now the way is long. Let us go together. The way is difficult, so let us help each other. The way is joyful, so let us share it. The way is Christ's, for Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. The way is open before us. Let us go with the love of God, the grace of Jesus, and the comfort and strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen.